So good evening, everyone. Um, I see we still have some participants that are coming online, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started just to be respectful of everyone's time. I wanna welcome you all to the last in um, this, well, academic years anyway, uh, virtual community lecture series. Um, we're really pleased for those of you who are able to join us tonight. We're super excited to be able to offer um, a chance to listen to um, both our Alpha Stem Cell Clinic director just briefly introducing um, the clinical relevance of uh, our presentation this evening, and Dr. Devin Lawson, who is um, one of our newer faculty at UCI, both here in the Stem Cell Research Center and in the Cancer Center, and she'll have a chance um, to be able to share her data and what she knows about stem cells um, and in the context of cancer and breast cancer specifically. So um, there we go, I'm able to advance. Um, Again, thanks for being here tonight. I wanna to give a, a couple of quick thank yous just to the folks who really make this all happen. I'm sure you, many of you have heard me say this before, but in particular, Brian Cummings, who's chair of our community outreach um, committee, Judy Beck, who handles communications for the center and many of you hear from, and um, of course, UCI media, media, it's Kyle Good, who's on with us tonight. And without their help, um, particularly in this chaotic time where they're trying to co coordinate virtual graduations, as we were just hearing, um, this could never happen. And so we're really grateful for their participation and their help. Most of you know, the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center has over 60 faculty. We're spread across six schools, more than 21 departments across colleges of health sciences and the schools of uh, biological sciences, engineering, law, and the arts. Our mission is really um, pretty straightforward. It's to move things through from discovery um, to training individuals, be they undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral students who are gonna go off and become faculty or work in biotech, and all of that on a translational pipeline where our goal is really to move things through that discovery phase and on into things that could have a real impact um, for people that are living with a variety of different degenerative or neurological or uh, different sorts of conditions, including cancer, where we're hopeful that stem cells and regenerative medicine will be able to have an impact. Um, as I mentioned uh, last time, we're very excited that CIRM refunded with Prop 14 is a ballot initiative. And actually we're well underway in this for the center in terms of the work that we need to do um, to take advantage of that funding that California voted um, to send the way of stem cell research and regenerative medicine. In fact, um, this Thursday, not even two days from now, we have our first major proposal that's going out and that is to reboot training uh, fellowships for graduate students, postdoc students and um, uh, medical residents who will have the chance to train in stem cells and regenerative medicine, work on community outreach, develop individual projects that have the chance of you know, coming in along that translational pipeline. So we're very hopeful um, for that funding. And of course we, um, are looking for partners to be able to make the most of that. And so for any of you who are listening, who are interested, we would be delighted to have you participate, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Facebook, um, visit our website. And of course, we are interested in leveraging that state funding as much as we can through our seed grant program, through adding in um, additional opportunities for fellowships, for our graduate students, for our postdocs, for these medical residents. So by all means, please reach out to us if you have any interest in um, making a gift. We'd love to hear from you. Very quickly, um, the lecture that we're on tonight is the Human Breast Cell Ax uh, Atlas. Unfortunately, Dr. Kessenbrock um, was unable to be here tonight. He had a chance after a year and a half to be able to visit with his family and he wisely took that opportunity. So it's my great pleasure to be able to have Dr. Daniela Boda, who's director of our Alpha Stem Cell Clinic, again, just share a little bit in terms of clinical relevance. I do wanna highlight though, before we move on to that, that we will start that for the fall with brain organoids, Tuesday, September 7th, 7 p.m. right here. We are hopeful that we will be able to be back in person, but we actually don't know the answer to that. So Judy Beck from the, um, from the center will be reaching out to let you know what the format um, is gonna be for that. Again, we're very hopeful that we'll be back in person, but we're in a little bit of a wait and see right now. 
With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Daniela Boda. She is both an MD and a PhD researcher, and she has a host of titles at UCI because she's pretty much in charge of the known universe. She is professor, um, not of physiology and biophysics, but of neurology, that's my bad. She's the vice dean for clinical research in the School of Medicine. She's the medical director for clinical research. She is the director of our uh, UCI Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center Alpha Stem Cell Clinic, which we are looking to um, gain new funding for through one of the upcoming sermon initiatives towards the end of this year. She's also the medical director for the neuro-oncology program. She received her MD in 1997, her PhD in 2003, and her subspecialty in neuro-oncology in 2011. And just for grins, her hobby is gardening. So you guys can tailor any questions that you have about your roses at the very end of the session. Briefly, I'm also gonna introduce Dr. Lawson before we move on to Daniela's uh, presentation. She is a relatively new faculty here and assistant professor in physiology and biophysics. Physics. She received training at UCLA, at UCSF, and joined BCI in 2015. Her hobby is softball. So we were just having a great conversation about softball um, before you all came on. A couple of quick words about formats. Um, we are going to have, because of the virtual format, our speaker presentations followed by a time for questions. So you can put your uh, questions if you would like to type them into the Q&A box. If possible, we'll answer those in real time, just depending upon who's speaking at the moment. If not, I'll be collating those on the side and uh, we'll come back and I'll moderate those questions and ask them for you um, from our presenters tonight at the very end. So with that, thank you very much um, for joining us. I am gonna stop my share and invite Dr. Boda to go ahead and start hers. And please welcome her and Devin to our presentation this evening. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Dr. Anderson. Just making sure that uh, we are seeing my screen and on my presenter slides. Uh, and I would like- you are you are in presenter mode, Daniela. Okay. Now I'm on slideshow, correct? Perfect. Excellent. So uh, tonight, first of all, I want to recognize all of you for joining us. It's so wonderful to see all names and new names uh, being here with us and learning about our achievements and about the extraordinary effort that takes place at UCI and especially in our stem cell research center to move basic science discoveries from the lab into the care of our patients. Many people will wonder uh, why stem cell therapies for cancer? We talk about stem cell therapies as being regeneration. Cancer is a very fast growing biology. Why would we want to regenerate cancer? And the answer is a little bit more complex than that. And I hope I'm gonna convince you that actually stem cell therapies could be a possible cancer cure. I have received funding from numerous federal agencies as well as CERM. And I've been working with different uh, companies that are trying to develop treatments on the cancer arena. I'm also very grateful for the support for many generous donors many of them being my patients that have made a lot of this work possible. So reminding everybody, we are a CERM funded clinical trial unit, Alpha Stem Cell Clinic. And our function is to accelerate the stem cell treatments for patients with unmet medical needs. And cancer is one of the biggest unmet clinical needs that we still have at this point in modern medicine. We always talk about the CERM network, the Alpha Stem Cell Clinics. And as you could see, we are six centers in California. And the top of the list of the conditions that we are trying to address in our clinical trials is cancer. Why do we keep so much hope and help on stem cells? There is a very large promise, a promise that it's finally come to fruition in a number of conditions. This promise has been recognized for the best of 15 to 20 years. I really especially like the quote from Michael J. Fox, which 
uh, reminds us that if potential for stem cell research is realized, it will mean an end to suffering of millions of people. There wouldn't be one person in this country who would not benefit or know somebody who will. So what are the stem cells? Stem cells as well mean many things to many people, but in general, a stem cell has the ability to continuously divide and differentiate into different other types of cells and tissues. When this is for normal cells and normal tissues, that's a welcoming process that happens during embryogenesis, as well as later in our life as part of the repair. But stem cells can also be tumor stem cells and they can differentiate into tumors. We have a few names that you're gonna hear. A totipotent cell, which can do everything in the universe. Basically, those are the cells from the very early embryos, where if the embryo divides, you can end up with twins. We have pluripotent cells that can differentiate, but they can form only about 200 cell types, not every cell type in your body. And then we have multipotent cells that are already differentiated, but they still can form a number of other tissues. So if you want to look at the way on which cells differentiate, you'll see that it's a hierarchy, very much like an army starting with a general and moving through the ranks until you get to the level of the soldiers. Why is this important? Because at every level of differentiation, more and more characteristics are achieved. And the more differentiated a cell is, the more able it is to do a special function in the body and the more able it is to accomplish that function with a great talent and energy. The example that I'm giving you here is the example of blood cells. And you'll see that this story is very relevant to us because the blood stem cells, the hematopoietic tissue lives in the bone marrow and it differentiated a number of cells that you are familiar with like the red blood cells and the platelets, but equally important, the white blood cells. And the white blood cells are the base of our immunity. So when people receive vaccines, the reason to receive a vaccine is to stimulate the white blood cells to recognize a pathogen and prepare an immune response that will remove that pathogen from circulation if an encounter with that pathogen happens. You can imagine that, that it's a very, very important process, especially for cancer, where many of the cancer go unrecognized by the immune system. And this is one of the main causes for which cancer appears in the body. Tumors also have treatment-resistant tumor stem cells. You see here an example that is near and dear to me, basically the neural stem cells that are forming the brain. In normal conditions, they form neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, which are the supporting cells and the functioning cells in your brain. But when there is an alternative pathway of development run by mutations and environmental factors, the neural stem cells can generate glioma stem cells, which can form brain tumors. There is a very similar process, complex and interesting, that Dr. Lawson is going to describe to you when talking about the hierarchy of breast cancer stem cells and their differentiated progenitors. Going back to our story about blood, let's look here again. We already learned about the differentiation of the hematopoietic cells. And here we see how the accumulation of mutations in the white cells are creating masses of cells that when affected by chemotherapy, the differentiated cells are eliminated, but the stem cell become resistant and continue to repopulate a tumor mass, or in this case, a number of tumor cells circulating in the blood and perpetuating the condition. Why is this an issue? This is an issue because many of the tumor cells, especially the tumor stem cells, generate immunosuppression. Not only that they are not properly recognized by the immune system, but once they take residence into a tissue, they produce more factors that inhibit the activity of the normal circulating immune cells like the T lymphocytes, 
and the macrophages and stop those cells from infiltrating and killing the tumor. So if we have this immune suppression and those resistant cells, how can we eliminate them from the tumor? How can we kill them? And with that eradicate the tumor, the cancer that we are trying to treat? The answer is quite new and quite complex. And it contains the process of taking the bone marrow stem cells, which are precursor of our immune responses, and engineer them so when they differentiate and they form T cells, the cells that are responsible of eliminating the cancer cells, those T cells know exactly where to go and how to select the cancer cells. Those engineered cells are called CAR T. And in general, what it will happen is now that the T cell will be genetically modified to have a receptor, like a lock and key mechanism that will gonna go and lock to a specific antigen, to a specific protein on the surface of the tumor cell, will bind to it like a dog to a bone. And after the binding happens, the T cell will create all the good mechanism where enzymes are released in the cancer cell and the cancer cells is poked to many holes so it can be destroyed. The reason for which I'm showing you this story is because this is not science fiction. This is an approach that we already have in clinical trials at UCI. And the clinical trial that I wanted to talk to you today includes patients with breast cancer. So this is a beautiful model how science gets translated on a treatment that hopefully has the opportunity to change prognosis for patients with advanced cancer. In this study, the treatment is patient-specific and patient-targeted. It's an early study. It's a phase one study. And we are trying on this study to find out the efficacy of an engineered design group of T cells specific to the markers for every patient, specific to the, each patient's tumor antigens. As I mentioned before, it includes many types of solid cancers, but was a focus for one of the arms of the study on the breast cancer. The types of breast cancer that this study includes are two types of cancer that we know that have a high risk of invasion and of dissemination in the body. One is the hormone receptor pos positive breast cancer, and the other one is one of the hardest cancers to treat, the triple negative breast cancer. Those are patients that have failed other treatments in the past, and which at this time need a new option of treatment. How is this product made? Those are those T cells, CD4 and CD8, that are genome engineered to express exactly the sequences that are the most effective, the most immunogenic in the patient's tumor. Those antigens, those epitopes, are present only in the tumor and not in the normal tissue, limiting the general toxicity that cancer treatments can have when they unselectively target both the cancer and the normal cells. So this, if it works, will be a personalized approach in a single dose. And if we are basing our hope on the results that we have from hematologic malignancies where this type of approach is already FDA approved, a successful treatment can provide a rapid and durable clinical benefit and potentially remission to those patients. There is a lot of science going into it. The complex informatic networks that analyze those thousands of proteins. After that, they, it's a step of complex production and verification. These cells are now selected from the patient's blood and weaponized by precision genome engineering and full functional characterization in the dish before the cells are given to the patients. This is the equivalent of a bone marrow transplant 
where we take away a faulty immunity that doesn't recognize the cancer and give back a precise immunity that it's able to recognize and selectively destroy the tumor that it's affecting the patient. There it's a complex study. The patients are treated, transfused, follow for two years, and hopefully we'll be able to follow people for even longer time as more and more people will get to survive this kind of complex cancer. We are right now working on defining what is the best dose to use. Hopefully very soon we will know what is the most safe and effective dose on our patients. And we'll continue to combine this treatment with other ways of stimulating the immune system to obtain the maximum benefit out of this new immune system that we are creating. In the end, hopefully we will understand better which are the cancers that will benefit from this treatment and hopefully we'll also learn how the next studies need to be designed in order to bring this approach closer to commercialization. So I want to close by reminding you that this is now that already we are getting long-term remissions with stem cell therapies in hematologic malignancies in blood cancers. Solid malignancies, as I showed you, are more complex. They have different levels of differentiation, multiple cell populations, lots of treatment resistance. But we are working on those novel approaches with the help of our scientists, our physicians, as well as our colleagues and in the funding agencies. So I hope soon I'll be able to present results to our community that will be similar to what we see in the hematologic malignancies. I will close here and uh, thank Dr. Anderson for the opportunity to talk to you tonight and I'll take questions at the end of the day. Daniela, thank you so much. Um, again, just to remind everyone, we'll be taking questions at the very end. I can see a couple are starting to come into the Q&A. Again, we'll track those. Perfect. I wanted to invite Devin to share her screen and Dr. Boda, if you could please mute and um, close your video. And we'll go ahead with the second component of the presentation. Please, Devin, go ahead. All right, great. Can you guys see my screen here? Oops, I think I just lost it. Nope, you're perfect. Let's see. Yep, just to play. One thing here. Ah, there we go. You're, you're All right. All right. And I guess we'll go ahead and enable the laser pointer so you can see my laser pointer. Can you see that? Great. Okay. So um, today I'm going to tell you all a little bit about um, an international project, actually, that my lab has been working on for the last several years. Um, it's called the Human Cell Atlas Project. And we've been using, uh, through this project, we've been using a series of new genomics technologies to try to better understand the human breast and how the cells within the human breast essentially um, can develop into breast cancer. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit of, of a backstory um, for how this project got started. So you guys probably recognize these two here. Uh, famous celebrities, Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Martin. I'm just kidding. That's that's probably for a different talk. Uh, <laughs> this is Mark Zuckerberg. Who you probably know um, due to his uh, uh, being one of the main founders of Facebook and his wife, uh, Priscilla Chan. So a few years ago, uh, these two guys got together and they had this crazy idea to see whether they could use their vast fortune to cure all human diseases within our children's lifetime. And this was essentially um, sort of inspired by the birth of their daughter, um, Maxima uh, Chan Zuckerberg. And they, um, at this time, established, announced the establishment of a new philanthropic organization called the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where they decided to do donate 99% of their wealth over their lifetimes, essentially, um, towards this initiative to see whether, in fact, we could um, use this money and this uh, organization to help cure, manage, or prevent all disease by the year 2100. So one, one of the projects um, that they're 
uh, philanthropic organization uh, essentially funded. It's called the Human Cell Atlas Project. And um, the mission or overall overarching mission of this project is essentially to create a comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of all human cells, which as you know, uh, we just talked a little bit about stem cells and how stem cells differentiate into different kinds of cells. Human cells are the fundamental unit of life. Um, they are, oh, sorry. Um, oops. Uh, as a basis for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating health and disease. So basically to put that in other words, um, we wanted to basically be able to find, describe, and map out every cell type in the human body and understand how cells change and tissues change essentially during disease. So in, in our case, in my lab, um, in our part of the project, uh, the, the breast, breast cancer. Okay, so Dr. Boda already told us a little about stem cells and how they give rise to the many different cell types of the body. So again, um, there are many, many different types of cells in the body. Again, these are the fundamental units of life. Um, they have all kinds of different functions. Um, they perform different functions in the body. So one example being immune cells, which Dr. Boda talked a little bit about already. There are dozens of different kinds of immune cells. Some of them shown here, megakaryocytes, dendritic cells and T cells. And these different kinds of immune cells all have unique functions um, towards essentially trying to eliminate or fight disease. Another example, of course, are muscle cells. So there's lots of different types of muscle cells as well as you can probably imagine, such as heart cells, um, which essentially function to contract and pump, pump blood throughout the body um, versus something like skeletal muscle cells, which essentially you know, help, help us move our muscles uh, and move to walk and do other things. And cells are essentially classified by their structure, location, function, and the molecules um, that they, they uh, secrete or present. So what's really crazy about the human body is that it contains an almost unfathomable uh, number of cells with different, um, different types of cells, incredibly diverse types. So it's estimated that there are over 37 trillion cells uh, within the human body. Um, our basic science textbooks will tell you that there might, might be about 300 major cell types. Um, but through this project, the Human Cell Atlas Project, we're learning that there's actually an incredibly much more amount of diversity so for example, in the, um, the retinal project, so a, a component of the eye, they're already learning that there's over a hundred different types of sub-subtypes of neurons just, just in the retina. So we hope that through this project, we're gonna learn a lot about how the body functions through understanding all the major cell types um, that comprise it. The first goal of this project is to basically find and characterize every cell in the body and understand what it does. And then the second goal of the project is to try and figure out where all those cells map essentially in the body. And this is just a cute little schematic representation of a map um, where we're trying to find out where the cells essentially localize. So again, the second goal of the project is to map um, every cell in the human body and how they interact with each other. And again, as I said before, the long-term goal of this project is to use all of this information or this atlas as they call it, to understand how, how cells and tissues change in disease. Okay, so you're probably asking how the heck are we gonna do this? Uh, that's a great question. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Um, we're gonna begin by characterizing the function of individual cells using uh, new single cell genomics technologies. So I'll show you in a minute, there's really been a revolution in genomics over the last 10 or 20 years that now enable us to do this um, at this high level of resolution. And these tools basically allow us um, to learn more about individual cells than we ever could uh, before using other tools. Obviously, we've been studying cells for many, many years, but we have a new opportunity now with these new tools uh, to understand a lot more about cells and where they localize. So again, as I said, we've come a really long way in genomics. In fact, some of you, um, maybe the older of you in the, in the audience, uh, maybe the younger ones too, have probably heard of the Human Genome Project. This was an incredible moonshot initiative um, launched in 1990. So I don't know, what is that? 30 years ago or so. Um, the goal was to sequence the entire 
human genome for the first time. So we didn't have the sequence of the human genome uh, before 2003. Um, it took them 13 years to do this. So it finished, they finished the project in 2003. It took collaboration from hundreds of labs worldwide to sequence over 3 billion base pairs in the human genome for a price tag of about $3 billion. So now in 2021, what's really amazing is using these new genomics tools that have advanced essentially over the last 30 years, uh, what we can do now is actually take a single cell. So here back in, in this day, we were taking millions of cells in order to um, accurately sequence all of the base pairs in the genome. Now we can take a single cell, essentially sequence the entire genome in about three days in an individual lab, for example, like my lab, and for somewhere on the order of 100 to 1,000 bucks. It's really quite a remarkable advancement in technology. And this is enabling us to be able to do projects, new and exciting moonshot projects like the one I'm talking about today, the Human Cell Atlas Project. Um, but actually for the HCA, um, our plan is to use this technology, single cell genomics, to sequence the whole transcriptome of an individual cell. And so transcriptome is a little different than the genome. Um, we're talking about RNA molecules here instead of DNA molecules. RNA molecules are essentially the key uh, molecules that convey information from the genome, so from the DNA, to build cells. So they're the fundamental messenger of the cell's function. So the DNA makes RNA and the RNA tells the cell what to do and how to function. What's really amazing is that when you sequence the whole transcriptome, you learn about all the different genes that are being expressed in that cell, and you can get a really, really high resolution idea of what that cell is doing. And thanks to all of this science over the last 30 years, we can do this for about 10 cents a cell. So we really now are kind of in the ballpark of being able to um, profile, you know, millions and millions of cells in the human body. So you're probably wondering what I'm talking about, like how this works. Um, so just a couple of like basic examples of how we're going to do the sequencing. So as I mentioned before, goal one was to characterize all the cells in the human body. And we're primarily using this single cell RNA sequencing approach. And basically what we do in order to separate all the cells uh, from a tissue, in our case, it's the breast, but for the case of the project, it's all the cells and different tissues of the body. And what we're doing is using these microfluidic chips, which you can see here, these little lanes um, that have been engraved in these chips um, to run essentially water and cells through them such that each cell that we isolate from the breast is encapsulated in a single droplet. So you can see that here, one, one cell per droplet. That's how we separate all the cells from each other. Also within each droplet is a bead that contains all of the reagents uh, necessary to do the RNA sequencing analysis. So it's a really clever way of separating all the cells from the tissue into individual little reaction volumes, like microscopic reaction volumes, so that we can sequence the transcriptomes um, of individual cells. And so here is just kind of an example of what um, you know, the, the little chip looks like. Um, and it looks kind of like a cassette tape, for those of you who remember what those look like, only it kind of fits in the, bottom, in the palm of your hand. For goal two, as I mentioned before, the second goal of the project is to map all the cells and actually figure out where they localize uh, in the organ or in the tissue. And this is a little bit more complicated. There are a bunch of different ways to do this. We're still working out technologies for this. Um, one technology that we've been using in my lab um, basically utilizes panels of antibodies. So in this case, as some of you know, antibodies essentially recognize a specific protein. And so what we can do is use a series of different antibodies which uniquely bind to different proteins, load them onto our tissue, so our breast tissue in this case. And then because each antibody has a unique label, a color label or fluorescent label, we can then look to see where the antibody binds and use that as information to identify or map, localize our different cells uh, in the tissue. And so here you can just see this multicolor image um, of a tissue section. I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a few minutes. Okay, so what's great about this project is that um, it's being conducted pretty much across the world. Um, so you can see here has over 2000 members from 76 different countries and over a thousand different institutions. It's really 
a big project um, where different groups are focusing on different tissues and different technologies to really kind of drive this project forward and get it done. So far, uh, the project is focused on 18 different tissues. So some of them are shown here. We've sequenced cells from over 6,500, almost 70, 79, or sorry, 6,900 individuals. Um, so that's different from the Human Genome Project, in which case they really focus on a couple of individuals um, to get the whole sequence uh, accomplished. Um, we've collected samples from 8,500 different individuals and sequenced over 46 million cells at this point. Um, but in my lab, like I said, like I mentioned before, we've really been focusing on the human breast because that's where our expertise lies. So we're experts in breast cancer. Uh, stem cell biology and cellular diversity. And so our group has been charged with trying to carry out this uh, work, um, focusing on the human breast. And you can see we have investigators from various different locations across the country. So um, Kai Kressenbrock and myself, as well as several others uh, from California, here at UC Irvine and other locations in California. We also have a number of different um, groups and labs in Texas, uh, so both at MD Anderson as well as at Baylor. And you can see we have some collaborators also working on this uh, on the East Coast uh, in Boston, um, as well as in New York, Old Spring Harbor and Harvard. Okay, so now, um, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our lab specific progress. Uh, in sequencing cells from the human breast. So just a little bit of background about the human breast. So you can see here that um, it is a glandular organ. So you can see the gland structure here in this side view that essentially secretes milk proteins during lactation. The gland is comprised of these ductal structures. We can see are these lines as well as um, these lobular structures at the end, which are essentially the cells that secrete milk during lactation. And all of these structures, the ducts and the lobules um, that perform this function are comprised of many different cell, cell types that help contribute to this function. Um, the gland is also surrounded by numerous other types of cells, such as fat cells, muscle cells, immune cells, um, what else? Uh, vascular cells, obviously every organ needs a blood supply. Uh, and so we've been, we've been working on trying to um, extract cells from the human breast and define all the different cells that, uh, that reside there. And why are we inter interested in this? Again, as I mentioned before, we study breast cancer and we really believe that by understanding all the cellular diversity in the human breast, that we'll be able to get a better understanding of which cells uh, essentially cause cancer in the breast and why, how they do it. So as some of you probably are aware, breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed worldwide. Unfortunately, there are about 1.7 to 2 million new cases diagnosed worldwide per year. And a woman's lifetime risk is one in 10. So one in 10 women um, on average will develop breast cancer during uh, her lifetime. So again, as I said, the goal of this project really in the long term is to figure out which cells are the ones that give rise to cancer. And you can see here in this schematic um, an example where um, cells within these lobular structures, so these are the guys that secrete milk, again, during lactation, these cells are starting to overgrow and sort of um, invade outside of the lobular structure and become cancerous. But there are actually many other different types of breast cancer. So there are also breast cancers which arise from other locations, such, such as, for example, the ducts. So in this example, I'm showing you um, a situation in which the cancerous cells are essentially arising from cells within in the ducts and starting to invade um, and become cancerous. And so um, basically what we want to know is, um, you know, which kinds of cells make cancer cells and, and why do you know, we suspect that different types of cells in the breast give rise to these different types of cancers. And, and we want to use this reference atlas, the human breast cell atlas, to figure that out. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, what we've learned so far. Um, so just some kind of basic overview. Our goal is to extract cells and do RNA sequencing on cells from about a hundred women. So far, we've done about 61 women and sequenced over 500,000 cells. 
A couple of notes about how we analyze this data. Um, I'll try and keep this simple, but essentially, as you know, there are about 20,000 genes or so in the genome, and we've sequenced about 500,000 cells. So what we do when we do whole transcriptome sequencing of, of each cell, we create this data matrix, which we call a single cell data matrix, where we basically have the, every single gene on one axis and every single cell that we've sequenced on the other axis, and then a value for the level of expression of that gene, basically in every cell. And we use this in order to quantify the expression of gene, each gene essentially, or RNA molecule in each cell. And then we take this data matrix and we use a mathematical algorithm to cluster or group the cells based on their relative gene expression. So you can see here in colors, cells that are closer to each other on these maps essentially are more similar um, than cells that are further apart um, from each other on these maps. So we can use these maps basically derived from this very complex, these very complex data matrices um, to understand the diversity and all the different cell types and cell states in, in the organ. So this is what we found so far. I'm not gonna go too deep into the data, um, but here you're looking at a plot, again, of cells that we've sequenced from uh, 60 so women and 500,000 cells. And what we've noticed so far is that there are about 11 different cell types um, in the breast, give or take a few. Um, some things that we found that were interesting and new, um, for example, we noticed um, there was a different, that there were actually two different ki kinds of luminal epithelial cells. So this green cell population and this red cell population here. Um, before this, it, this was less clear um, from other, prior work uh, in the breast. So this was kind of an interesting surprise. Um, we also learned that many of these cell types, these 11 cell types that I'm showing here, actually are comprised of further diversity, what we call cell states. So cells that are still luminal epithelial cells, but seem to be slightly different with respect to their expression pattern, suggesting that they're probably doing something a little bit different at that given moment in time from each other. And we've um, essentially identified dozens of substates within some of these cell types, like the luminal cells, the basal epithelial cells, um, and some of the fibroblasts or cells that support the glandular structure. So as I said, this is a work in progress that we're still working on, but there've already been some interesting uh, surprises. And as you know, the second goal of the project um, is to spatially map these cells. So here again is um, an image of the breast, um, sort of from the side view. And the way that we do the mapping um, in sort of uh, uh, basic terms is we take slices, very, very, very thin slices of tissue um, from the breast. And so that way we can map our cells essentially in two dimensions using that antibody technique that I just talked about a minute ago. So this essentially is a cross section basically taken like this through the, through the organ, where again, you can start to see some of these structures in two dimensions that you can see in three dimensions. So this is a lobule here with all these little um, buds or alveoli that are um, comprised of cells. And these, for example, are ducts, um, which basically drain here to the nipple um, to essentially drain the milk during lactation. And then you can see surrounding these structures, there are all these other kinds of cells which support um, the glands uh, and the, these functions. So in a nutshell, what we're doing here, again, is using this antibody-based te technology that I mentioned a few slides back. Um, to see if we can find these 11 cell types and all of these dozens of cell states actually in um, um, a spatial representation or a slice of the breast. Um, so here again, just to, just to remind you, we, have, we basically create panels of antibodies where each individual antibody will recognize a unique protein, a protein that we've noticed from our single cell data set um, uniquely recognizes a different cell type or a different cell state. We incubate those antibodies um, onto our tissue, or our tissue slice in this case. And again, as you remember, um, the different antibodies are essentially labeled differently um, with different colored labels so that we can actually, when we, when we look um, by microscopy at our tissue sections, we can use the colors to identify the different cell types that we're interested in. And then we can overlay all the colors together to get a sense of where the cells are in relationship to each other and whether they localize to lobules or ducts or 
surrounding tissues. So here's just an example image of something that we've been working on. Obviously this is, a, is um, uh, this part of the project we believe will take much longer. It's a much more complicated task, um, but you can see we've already made some good progress mapping um, some of our key cell types um, into these structures. So here are just a couple of different antibodies or different proteins, um, which you can see differentially localized to the ducts here or the lobules um, of the tissue. And you can see that here in higher magnification, red cells um, that express keratin-19, white cells here that express smooth muscle actin, and then cells in the middle here, for example, that are yellow, which presumably express both keratin-5 and keratin-19 or different proteins that um, um, are on the surface of these different cells. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and leave you guys there. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, this obviously was a very large project um, done by, as I'd mentioned before, many different groups um, at different institutes. Um, of course, I'd like to thank um, many of the people in my lab, as well as Kai Kessenbrock and the folks in his lab um, who over the years have been working on this project. McNaven's lab at MD Anderson um, and some a few key people that have carried out these uh, studies in his lab. And then of course, all of our many um, other collaborators here at UCI, as well as at the other institutes uh, that I mentioned. So thank you all very much for your attention. And I guess now we have some time for questions. Kevin, that was really great. Um, thank you so much. So I think um, lots of people online will just join me in thanking both you and Dr. Boda for um, just two really clear presentations, I think, that make this complicated subject so accessible. So um, we have a number of questions. I'm going to start out with one for Daniela. And um, it's something that's very much, I think, on the minds of people as regenerative medicine strategies play in the news. And that's, um, with personalized medicine, such as engineering patient specific CAR T cells, um, despite our, all of our enthusiasm for this in terms of the, the potential to treat um, diseases like cancer, the expense of that gets a lot of play in the media, right? And so personalized medicine strategies that may come from these approaches as Devin has described and then get implemented into clinical trials come with a cost. And so um, I guess the one, I would ask you to comment on that more broadly and whether we can expect to see that start to change at some point in the future. And the specific question that's asked is, what does this really cost at the laboratory level as opposed to how um, this gets implemented at the time that we move past clinical trial into approved therapies as we've seen for a couple of target indications recently? Please go ahead. So uh, this is an excellent question because it always talks to the fact that the more sophisticated treatments we have, initially their cost is very high. Uh, we also have to be aware of the fact that as a treatment becomes more streamlined, more used in more conditions and uh, by more than one uh, company, the cost of the treatment goes down. It is true that if we base our findings on the costs of treatment that I mentioned, things like Yescarta, the CAR T treatment for uh, blood cancers, you'd expect the cost of this treatment to be somewhere in hundreds of thousands, 400,000 to 800,000, including the very complex care that those patients need to have with hospitalizations and care similar as a bone marrow transplant. But as the time is passing, those costs we expect to go lower. Many people ask, is it the cost that it, it's actually the manufacturing of the product? In reality, it's never always only the manufacturing of the product. It's also the years of science that went on discovering the specific treatment and uh, the numbers of other similar treatments that failed to make an effective treatment. So we pay a very high cost for research and development. And this is very near and dear to many of us. And it's a very fine line to, to balance between the cost of saving a human life and the societal cost of having to carry the burden of some expensive treatments. So I, mean, I think that's a really excellent response. I, I um, would jump in and 
me ask a question, I mean, answer a question, although Danielle, I'll invite you to comment, um, that hasn't quite been asked. Mm -hmm. And that's to bring this full circle um, in the context of CERN. So Daniela highlights some really um, excellent issues, some big issues that are um, a part of the driver for those high costs. And the challenge that we all face, certainly that Dr. Boda faces as a, as a clinician and, and we in the laboratory at the basic science level face is how to see these things brought through that we think have hope at the bench level into bedside treatments. And I think she gives an excellent summary of all the reasons that those are expensive. It's important though to understand, I think, that one of the missions of CIRM and the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine is to take this into account and make sure that um, the therapies that are focused on regenerative medicine that are developed with that support will move through into clinical trial and clinical application in a way that's accessible broadly to patient populations and um, where some of the intellectual property and the costs that have bor been borne by CIRM and by California will be reflected in bringing that price down um, as quickly as possible and getting it set as low as possible. And so Daniela, I would just invite you as the director of the ASCC, maybe to say a few extra words in that regard. Uh, this is a great topic because CERM is playing such an essential role in trying to make sure that the cellular therapies developed in California are accessible for California patients and Californian state constituents. And we spend a lot of time thinking about social determinants of uh, access to those therapies. And a lot of the efforts that we do right now are not only about the cost, but also about how to disseminate those therapies to different communities, some of them being underserved or farther from the big hubs, such as our universities. Uh, it has been uh, very heavy in our minds, uh, the recent problems that uh, a company which will remain unnamed was uh, facing in uh, not offering basically a life-saving treatments that were developed to some help for children with a severe autoimmune condition, the bubble children, the bubble boy condition. And CERM has very swiftly intervened in the situation and basically stopped funding to a company that was not leaving to their mission of providing a treatment that could be potentially life-saving out of financial considerations. And after receiving CERM funds. I will expect yep. that we're going to see more of that appropriately heavy-handed approach in making sure that treatments stay here and they're accessible to the people that supported them. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. And, and I think it just raises for me, I, I think the complexities of this are really a lot. And so we should maybe think about in the fall when we're coming back as we're setting the rest of our program now, I think that might be a great topic um, for a lecture to just talk about how we need companies to be able to move these strategies forward, but we also have to have some checks and balances for these investments that are being made to try and make sure that therapies are given where they're available and that we manage this cost issue. Certainly for all of us, it's as Daniela said, very much on our minds. Um, so uh, a second question that we have um, also from Dr. Robertson is that it seems like solid tumors would require some combination of engineering um, T cells along with techniques to potentially adjust the permeability of the blood tissue barrier. All tissues have this to some degree, but certainly the brain and the central nervous system, this is a large issue. And are there strategies um, to be able to enable that, to make these um, uh, this therapy development more broadly available into tissues that are just hard to get to? So fortunately, the T cells are uh, very good at sneaking into the tumors. The question is how do we attract them inside of the tumor? And when in the, they're in the tumor, how we keep them from being inhibited by the immune inhibitory signals. So there are multiple ways of doing that. Some of them that uh, we are exploring at UCI are viral therapies, trying to infect the tumors with viruses, oncolytic viruses, that will then destroy parts of the tumors and release antigens into circulation. In that way, attracting antigen presenting cells, helping the, them migrate into the tumor and doing local T cell activation. Even in the study that we were discussing before, I 
I was speaking very fast, but I don't know if uh, it was visible that we're using interleukin-2, trying again to modulate, modulate the local inflammatory milieu, as well as for certain cancers, the combination with PD-1, PDL-1 inhibitors, trying to stop the cancer cells from inhibiting the T-cell interaction. So immunotherapy is still very complex. That's a good reason for which it got a recent Nobel Prize. And we are trying to look at multiple levels of uh, modulating the immune responses. I think that's a, a great answer, a comprehensive one. Um, one last question on uh, Daniela's topics. And then uh, Devin, if you'll bear with me, we're gonna um, jump ship over to you in just a moment, but a lot of these don't combine very well. So we're having to do them in a little bit of a linear fashion. Um, we have a question from the audience. How is uh, the stem cell treatments uh, uh, differs from treatments that are targeting MAP kinase signaling pathways, which has more of an advantage? I think um, you sort of just touched on this, Daniela, and sometimes that it may be really a combinatorial strategy that we think is ultimately going to win the day. So please go ahead. Uh, I would agree with you that usually it's a combinatorial strategy that will win in the day. Uh, MAP kinase inhibitors, the clear example being the BRAF inhibitors, have revolutionized cancer such as melanoma that have mutations on this pathway as drivers. But even on that family of cancers, only a certain patient subpopulation will have that mutation that can be targeted, which leaves you as a large number of patients that do not have the mutation. Solid malignancies are very sneaky and not all of the cells are carrying the same mutations. They're polyclonal. So what happens many times, even with the patients that initially respond to those inhibitors, it's very possible that the next cancer recurrence is going to become resistant to one generation or the other or to all the drugs from that family. So it's very rarely that one inhibitor or one drug wins the battle in the complex metastatic patients. And we will probably have for many of the patients use multiple approaches in order to achieve multiple emissions. That's perfect. And actually it's a, a great segue um, into another question, which is um, shifting over to you, um, Devin, Dr. Lawson. There are some gene mutations associated with increased risk of breast cancer. The BRCA gene mutations are an example. Um, are these mutated genes expressed differently in the different cell types of the breast, right? And I guess I would add on to Daniela's answer and ask you to comment, what's the consequence of that potentially in terms of thinking from a therapeutic point of view, right? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So in patients, if we're talking about like patients with a family history of, um, you know, BRCA1 or BRCA2 mediated breast cancer, um, in that case, actually, the individual um, is, you know, has that mutation in all cells in the body. But as we've learned, you know, also through the transcriptome analysis that I was mentioning, all genes are not expressed in every cell in the body. And that goes, um, that's also the case for the breast. So we found that um, those genes have specific and unique functions in different breast cells. And when they're mutated or deleted, um, either in the germline, so, you know, from birth or later on through, you know, spontaneous mutations, they can have very, very different outcomes or effects depending on, you know, which cells they're, you know, they're being expressed in. And so, um, actually one thing that we found, uh, it's a shame Kai wasn't able to be here today to share the BRCA1 project, but, um, one thing that we found that's really interesting is, uh, those breast cancers mediated by BRCA1 seem to be, um, initiated by a very specific type of cell, actually a st very stem-like cell, uh, in the breast. And that is part of the reason that they tend to manifest more aggressively than some of the other, um, more luminal-like breast cancers. Um, so there's really, again, a lot of merit to um, understanding cellular diversity and stem cells and, and how these genes have different effects in different cells, because it, it, when it comes to treatment, we will need to treat them on a cellular specific level for sure. Yeah, I think um, it really totally highlights the importance and the, and the relevance of the kind of mapping approaches that, that you've been taking. We, it happens to transition also into um, another question from the from the audience in terms of doing this mapping and, and the 
um, elegant snapshot that's provided, but at a single point in time. And so is there a temporal regulation so that you know these genes in different cell populations are going up and down over time, either you know during just natural aging as some of us may be going through or right contributing to risk factors and then just spinning that out one step more and coming back to Dr. Boda's comments, you know, whether as different populations within a tumor might be changing if there's a change in regulation of some of these um, genes as well. So go ahead. Yeah, these are great questions. And it's something that we grapple with all the time in terms of um, throughput, right, for the project, because, you know, our goal is to sequence like thousands of cells from 100 individuals. Um, but there are so many levels of complexity um, that can impact um, how cells function and how they may become cancerous. So th things that we think about all the time are um, age, for example. So the breast changes a lot with age, um, pre-menopause, post-menopause, little changes impact breast cancer a lot and they impact the way the breast is structured and also um, the cell types that are there. So we, we, we try to sample um, cells from women of diverse ages, for example, and in, in diverse stages of life stages, pre-menopause, post-menopause, pre-puberty. Um, but there's a lot of other things too. You know, we there uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative just in, um, launched a new call for diversity to make sure that we also are going to ramp up our efforts, you know, to really sample women of diverse ancestral backgrounds, because this is really important, we know, um, in terms of clinical manifestation of disease. Women from different ancestral backgrounds tend to get different types of breast cancer, and they need to be treated very differently. Um, so all these things really impact um, our analysis, and it is hard to get enough throughput, <laughs> right, to do thousands of women and then thousands of cells from each, each women. And these are the issues that we're planning um, to deal with over the next five, 10, you know, years of this project. So that, that's a great question. Um, that, that will be yeah. a big problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. And just the sheer, um, it's hard, uh, I think for people to appreciate just the sheer volume of data that you're talking about. And that's so that's also an issue of like storing yeah. all the data and analyzing it with computers that are large enough to, to do this, you know, these giant matrices. So it's crazy. It's really yeah. remarkable. And I think it's really important to put that in perspective, right? That those technological technological leaps in terms of, you know, the software side and the hardware side of what enables you to do the analysis are, are you know, kind of lockstep to the advances that you can make in terms of these techniques. So it's the case all the time in terms of what we do along this translational pipeline. Um, you know, this is for our lay audience, right? That we go back and revisit questions that we've asked in the past because now we can ask them differently at a more yes. sophisticated level or with greater data throughput. And so I think that's sometimes hard to understand in terms of, you know, isn't that all said and sifted? But lots of times it's not, right? And it's only by applying those new technologies that we get these different windows of, of insight. Yes. So kind of on that, we have a, a, a question, um, that's just sort of linked and I wanna make sure it gets asked that from 61 tissues, yada, yada, how diverse are these data sets and how do you extrapolate, right? Even with current technology, how do you extract the features that you think are important there? Yeah, I mean, I guess we just spoke, we just spoke to that a little bit. Um, obviously with 61 patients, when we're looking, wanna look at different life stages and different um, ancestral backgrounds and um, different time points, like all the, you know, it, it is very difficult. Um, so, so far what we've been going for is trying to find like commonality. So what cell types and states are present in all women of all, you know, backgrounds and all life stages and ages um, and, uh, you know, with other various clinical parameters. So we're starting from like a very baseline um, to generate a very baseline atlas. And then, you know, as I said, over the next 10 years or so, we expect to add on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other women um, as we learn how to sample them cheaper and faster and, and um, you know, with better throughput. So I think that's kind yeah. of, the, as you mentioned, with the technology development, that's kind of the way the project's going to progress over time. But it's a big yeah, challenge. I think, 
I think that's right. And it's a big challenge. It's going to be an ongoing one. I, I think in passing, you've um, answered indirectly a couple of the other questions that, are see here, that I see here. I do want to throw one in particular out for you, though, because it brings out um, uh, just an issue in terms of understanding the biology um, and ask you to comment on it. And that's um, during the single cell RNA sequencing categories for different cell types. Um, our non-coding RNAs, and I think you might have to spend a moment to just talk about what a non-coding RNA is, are those taken into account for classification of cell diversity and, and what do you do with that information? Yeah, I guess um, that's a good question. You know, um, at this point in the initial phases of the project, we focused mostly on RNA um, to get to the basic understanding of what this, these different cell types are doing. And by RNA, I mean um, transcribed RNA, the transcriptome, right? Um, Non-coding non RNAs, so anything that has like a poly A, you know, a cell that will be transcribed to make a protein would be included in our data set. Um, so other types of RNA would be excluded, unfortunately, at this stage. Um, so uh, just take a moment, if you will, and tell, tell me, what a non-coding RNA does, right? So uh, if a, a coding RNA is going to make a protein, make a protein. Have a one in one protein idea, that's right. So what does a non-coding RNA do? Because I, I think it's an interesting topic. Be certainly those had not been discovered when I was in high school, for example. That's a good so what point. Do they, what do they do? Why are they important? Yeah, so over the years, we've discovered that it's not as just as simple as RNAs make a protein and proteins make cells do things. Um, it turns out that you know, the DNA to RNA to protein dogma, I guess, is a lot more complicated where there are actually RNAs that regulate the expression of other RNAs and they can suppress them, um, you know, sort of uh, before they become made into proteins. And there are all kinds of levels of regulation of, you know, RNA to protein, even beyond that, I, I think um, that we could talk about as well. And, and this, this approach at this phase in the project is missing those levels of regulation. Um, some of the groups are starting to implement other things like um, attack sequencing. So they're looking at epigenetic, some other epigenetic um, features of cells and like using that information to classify cells. But um, we will, it'll be a little while. Um, I mean, we've even just start, only started doing proteome analyses, right? So um, like protein level analyses. So it will be a while before we can do single cell level everything, <laughs> uh, some of these other la layers of regulation. Um, but that is definitely their goal um, to really get at everything about the cell that we can use to understand its function. Yeah, and I, I think that's probably a good place um, for us to wrap up. I think we've at least touched on all of the questions that are here. And it really brings us back home to the idea that um, of this ongoing set of technological leaps, right, that needs to happen. So eventually one day from single cells, we'll be able to get this complete set of information probably, right? And, and have the, the data processing capacity to be able to analyze it and make something of it. Um, but we're not there yet. And this is what the discovery process is, right? And so science ends up being um, for our audience, very incremental that way where it progresses in leaps and bounds because we can do single cell seek when we couldn't in the past, right? So we have a host of new discoveries that comes from that, that informs us about the stem cell populations and different aspects of the potential for regenerative medicine and, and targeted strategies, targeted therapies. But this is a rinse and repeat kind of thing. And so we will be revisiting this same ground again in the future. Um, and all of that is what ultimately gives us progress. And it's all because of foundations like the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, institutions like CIRM, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, and of course, the National Institutes of Health. And um, we have not been doing, you know, sort of my broader introductions that, that I um, had focused on in the first couple of years that we did this. But one of the things that I always try and bring home is the importance of that chain of funding that we need to fund basic science discovery research and technology development because ultimately it really matters. It's what moves us forward in terms of being able to get to the therapy part of regenerative medicine. So with that, I just want to, um, having taken over the podium for a minute there, I wanna thank um, Drs. Lawson and Boda for joining us tonight. Really thank you very much for your time and for some great lectures and many thanks to our audience. And I look forward to seeing all of you in September 
good heavens, I hope in person. With that, have a safe and healthy summer and everyone take care.